Okay, so we've seen how in computer vision things have changed quite drastically. Um, until 2012, pipelines for detection would have looked like this with a hand engineered feature stage followed by a learning stage. Since the Hinton result in 2012, things are just learned end to end where this neural net is just some computational fabric that can learn pretty much anything. You give it the right training data, it'll hopefully learn the right thing and it actually often does. To look at some benchmarks, vertical axis is error rate, lower is better. Um, horizontal axis is the year at which the competition was held. This is one of the main image recognition competitions on ImageNet. These are traditional computer vision approaches leading into 2012, essentially kind of flatlining. Um, then in 2012, the Hinton entry came in right there. And at that point, uh, as the trainer alluded to, a lot of people switched over to deep learning approaches and it also accelerated pr progress quite a bit. Same thing happened in speech around the same time. And so one question to ask is, well, doesn't the robotics pipeline look exactly like the old vision pipeline? I would argue it does. Hand engineered state estimation, hand engineered control policy classes, a little bit of learning at the end, and that's how you get things to work. So why not replace the whole thing by a deep neural net too and get that to work this way, just like was already done in vision and speech. As a couple of people already alluded to, the big difference though is that vision and speech have been solved or made progress on as supervised learning problems. And the question is, now we have a reinforcement learning problem. Can you still apply deep learning there successfully? Meaning that now you have consequences of your actions. Take an action, you need to deal with the consequences. Take an action, this new situation, and this repeats. And this poses new challenges. Challenges in terms of exploring the space, how to understand if you got a good reward, what that can be attributed to. And you need to keep memory around of what you've seen in the past and might want to reuse going forward. What I want to do is show that despite these challenges, a couple of uh, things have already happened that show that this very well might be possible. So the first example here on the left shows the kind of results you can get learning to go directly from pixels to actions, that is from pixels on the screen for playing an Atari game to joystick commands. And several groups has, have achieved these kind of results with the first one being from DeepMind uh, over in London. Then some work here at Berkeley um, is on, from scratch, learning what it means to walk or run. So this robot here in simulation is just being told that there's a positive reward for fast forward speed, a negative reward for how hard you hit the ground. And over time, it figures out that the right thing to do is actually to figure out some kind of walking gait to make as fast forward progress as it can. But we never told it what walking or running looks like, we just told it Forward speed is good, hitting the ground hard is bad. So here it's able to complete the whole cycle. And you can apply, the beauty is that you can run the exact same algorithm for the Atari games as you can run for locomotion. <coughs> so this is quite general, the approach. You don't need to change the algorithm going from Atari games to locomotion or locomotion on a different system or even getting up, which you'll see soon in that video. Um, the other thing is we've been looking at this together with Trevor, Sergey Levin, and Chelsea Finn uh, at how can you get this to work on the real robot. Some tricks have to come into play to get this to work with far less data than you would have in simulation, but there are ways to get this to work. Here the robot is learning to insert that trapezoid shaped block into the shape sorting cube. And after about a few hundred trials, it actually has learned to succeed at doing this. It starts with not even knowing how its own arm works. And the middle robot here is learning to get up. High reward for head high up, and low reward if the head is low. What are some of the frontiers that I'm seeing? Um, first one is one that Trevor alluded to a lot already. That is, how do you transfer information from different domains into, domain, into the domain you care about? This could be simulated domains. This could be just static images. This could be other robots than the robot you have yourself. You could have multiple copies of your robot. Can you get this to work together? Exploration is a big challenge, but here are some graphs showing that some progress has been made where if you are clever about exploration, the blue graphs are the current results, the black ones are the old deep mind results that you can actually learn to play, performance up higher is better. Um, you can explore far more quickly than what they have had in these initial results. Dealing with memory actually um, is a really big challenge. If you're around tomorrow, Yoshima Benjo will give a talk at the X Colloquium at 4 p.m. in Soda Hall. A lot of it will be about how to deal with memory in recurrent neural nets. Uh, that's a big challenge that's important to resolve. And then a big part of this is actually going through the experimentation cycle. 
Like, effectively what happens is you think of some neural net, you think of some domain, and now you need to check if your idea works or not. And having good tools is critical to make that cycle fast. And so at Berkeley, we have a couple of tools now. There are other tools out there, but for example, at Berkeley, we have CAFE and CGT, which help in going quickly through that cycle and test your ideas and see if they might work or not work, and then iterate based on the failure cases you're still seeing. Thank you.